and let's go with the refresher first so you can ask questions in whoops uh yeah yeah so you can ask me anything i it's some mix up with the slides so you can ask questions in the mentimeter uh but you can also just ask questions in the zoom chat and zoom chat might be probably better uh for golang 01 we can use the format package to print our results to the screen right yes you can okay so but golang 01 is only for the bprog guys the uh, cloud guys don't have the assignment yeah so there are no tasks i mean that there are some tasks i i showed some um if you go to the wiki uh there are some uh there are some tasks but they are just for playing around there are not assignments so assignments will be submitted by christopher and the cloud teaching team and they will be a little bit more about the cloud tech so they will be about http and the dot uh, the net package and so on these ones are just sort of are playing around with a simple uh golang constructs and for the cloud people uh, for the cloud course, those are not required. Those are just optional for you to try things out. Uh, there was, um, let me see, yeah. That's clear, right? Uh, you can use math and round, of course, yes. Do you need any packages? Uh, no, I don't think so. So there is a question, do you need any uh, maybe I start recording though those questions are good for general yeah I'm already recording All right so um there is a question of uh whether you need um special packages for uh visual studio code um and when you install the extension it will automatically ask you to confirm that you want to install all the kind of dependencies and it installs some additional Golang packages like tools for the tooling. Um, and uh, you should always uh, allow it to do this. So allow the Visual, the, the Visual Studio code to do whatever it needs to kind of wire things up. Um, there is another question. Uh, should you use modules versus packages? Never use packages, always use modules. So always initialize your mod file and always use modules uh if you try to use just packages it's a nightmare don't don't go this path um any other questions uh okay so how do i get access to the gitlab repo uh the repo is if you click on the course uh proc 205 2022 so you'll get to the kind of a main page and then the repo is just here you can clone it so you you clone the repo or if you want to browse the repo in a um, sort of same interface i guess you just click repository uh, and then you can uh, clone it <coughs> and students are here any other questions no other questions so far if you have questions yeah post them on the uh zoom zoom chat or uh menti so the question is go object oriented or not um that that's a good question um it depends how you define object orientation uh so if um you define object orientation in such a way that you require inheritance, for example, uh, then it's not. But if you define object orientation in terms of encapsulation, that you have certain functionality encapsulated on certain structs, then yes, uh, go would fit the definition. So it sort of depends what it means to be object oriented. Um, my personal definition of what object orientation is kind of follows a little bit what Alan Kay 
uh, defined using uh, object orientation for sending messages. And it's very controversial because languages such as C++ are not object oriented according to that definition. Uh, so you can read about it online. Uh, it's a bit of a ranty, uh, ranty thing. Uh, will Go be a big part of the project? Yes, in the cloud course it will be. Uh, you will do the big project in Go. Okay, um, so let me go to, uh, those are questions, yes. So how do I mark it as answered? I don't know. Um, I just continue here. I see, I can do this. So I can show questions. Are we allowed to import string or regex for Golang um, 01? Yes. Of course you are. For Golang 01, you can import anything you want. Uh, the, the black box constraints are not here, but this is for the BPROC class, not for the cloud course. Uh, please ask questions related to the cloud course in, the, in, in here for, for now. Otherwise, the people who are not doing um, PROC 2006 get a bit confused. <clears throat> okay, so will it be a big part? Yes, it will be. Uh, how fundamental is Go for the cloud tech group? It's uh, fundamental. You will all have to do something in, uh, in Go uh, for the project, but you can clarify that with Christopher. Um, <clears throat> so will cloning the Git repository into an OneDrive folder cause a problem? Um, Mm, that's a good question. I usually don't do that, but I don't think it should, uh, but it might. <laughs> so I don't know how the one drive syncs uh, with the versions, so like how it versions uh, itself. Uh, so I know that some um, uh, cloud drive solutions, they sometimes don't play too nice with Git, but most of the time it should be fine. I, I've used uh, get on on uh, Google Drive and it was fine, so I I would think it should be okay. Um, exactly. So Oscar is saying if the repo is already in the Git, why would you use a uh, cloud drive? Uh, you can always pull from the Git. Git is sort of like a cloud drive for you. So you can just use local drive instead, local uh, um, place in your local drive. That's a good point, uh, Oscar. All right, so I will continue with the with the slides. So, question to you guys: uh, Have you? Oi, 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 oi. How do I change that? Um, let's see. Why do I get rid of this? Uh, it's so annoying. Okay, let me see if I refresh the page. Yes, that's good. So most of you did the go tour. Uh, it's better than last, like two days ago. <laughs> Uh, so I do encourage those people who ha hasn't done that to do it. Uh, Go tour is an interactive tutorial for Golang, uh, and you should do it. You should do it. It's not that long. Um, people who done it, how long it took you to go through it? Use um, Zoom maybe. It's not that long, uh, and it will kind of give you a good. Um, yeah, it's quite quick. So as Ben is saying, half an hour. I think I took a bit longer. I was sort of reading more kind of carefully all the idiomatic way of doing things. Um, all right, you should do it. Um, okay, so a little bit of a quiz. We have uh, some, I think we have eight questions. So, um, you know, the stakes are high. <laughs> Pay attention, answer the questions. So please join in. Um, and it will sort of be a refresher for 
uh, some of the know-how in uh, in Golang. So I will wait for the first 50 people. Excellent. So we have uh, 28 to go, be quick. Uh, all right, so first question. Lambda functions are simply written as func without a name. True or false, or Go does not have lambdas, I don't know. Do you know what lambdas are? What are lambda functions? You know them from Python, you know them from Java, you know them from C++. Uh, yes, it's as simple as, um, so let's see if I have some, uh, let's go to our hello world main function. So if I want to do something and I need a function and I don't want to declare it, I can pass it as a Lambda and the Lambda will be simply, um, so let's say um, we, will, we will do it in a minute, but let's say I have an apply function, which takes another function as a parameter. Then I can say, um, okay, I can have a func here, func our famous adder, um, okay. And I can say apply uh, will take add, but if I want to do it inline, I can say func and then declare what parameters func takes and what body it has, and then it will be the same. And this function doesn't have a name. And typically we call all functions which don't have names, lambda functions. And that's the way you do it in Golang. So the answer to the quiz is true. You simply write it as a func without a name. Easy enough. All right, next one. So go start quiz. Go has type inheritance like C++. Well, okay, I gave away uh, the answer in the previous round. Um, so do does Go have inheritance? And the answer is not really. Uh, so it doesn't have it, but you have some ways around it, right? So um, one is composition, which we demonstrated in the previous class. We've used structs which were composed out of other structs and we sort of build our student to be a person without really inheriting from a person, but using composition. Of course, you can use delegation as well. Uh, and then there is this fancy type, which is called interface open close bracket. So what is that one? Well, that one is kind of like a fancy type, which everybody inherits from. <laughs> it doesn't do anything. It doesn't have any methods. It's sort of like uh, an object in Java. Like if you know Java, uh, you have the type called object. Um, and then everything is descendant from object. In Golang, everything is in descendant of interface opens and close bracket interface. Yeah. So that's the kind of like a placeholder. So let's say I want to have a function, um, uh, a magic function, a magic function which takes anything, right? It doesn't do anything. It's a useless function, but I want it to accept any possible type. So I will say it accepts a data, which is of type interface like this. And then I can call magic. I can call magic with my Lambda function. I can call magic with uh, integer and I can call magic with a string. Uh, hello world, and it will all work fine, right? Um, it is quite useless uh, because uh, you know that function doesn't do anything. But I can interrogate internally uh, in here what type I was passed in, and then I can do something depending on that type. Uh, and how you interrogate um, types in um, in Golang, you say d 
slash uh, int, for example. And then if it's okay, uh, and then ds int, it's kind of a bit of a complex uh, uh, thing. So this interrogates if d, my parameter, is of type int. And if it is, okay will be true. And then this variable will be casted to int. So this will be an int. Uh, so then I can do something with it, right? Uh, so if I sort of do this um, kind of a type coercion, I can check, okay, what type is D and then I can do some, some stuff with it. Uh, so, but let's focus on the interface. Uh, so interfaces is a mechanism in Golang to do what typically you achieve via kind of a polymorphic inheritance. So there is a, a, a really uh, fundamental, one of the fundamental interfaces in, in Golang. Uh, which we've used on uh, on Monday is Stringer. So um, in format, um, so let's say we pass something S, which is a Stringer, and Stringer is called like this. And Stringer is an interface. Uh, if I show you what Stringer looks like, uh, so go like format Stringer. Um, it will be go to format and format has um, stringer type and the stringer type is an interface which uh, wait, 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 where do I lost it? Yeah, here. So um, stringer is a type. Uh, it's an interface and it has a single method called string. Uh, and that means anything that implements a string function becomes an instance of a stringer type. Uh, so then I can pass uh, things to it and it will work. So in, in our case, uh, I'm passing um, S to my magic. And what I can do is I can call string function on it, right? Uh, so for example, I can print it to, to the screen as a, as a string. So let's say I will call print line and then I call S string. And then I am guaranteed that S, whatever I pass in here has the, the uh, string function. So uh, my function, uh, the Lambda function doesn't have it. So I cannot pass it to my magic. Okay, that doesn't work. Uh, number one doesn't implement the stringer interface neither, so that doesn't work. Uh, and then hello world, um, it uh, the string itself doesn't implement the stringer interface neither, right? Uh, so I cannot do that. But remember when we had a type student? Uh, so let me. Let me do something else. Let me close this and I will reopen it with the dot instead. And you will see that inside, um, inside, what is this one? Where are we? We are in hello world. Yeah, so that's not the, the one I want. Uh, so if I, uh, that's a little bit, okay, so let me, let me do it here because I haven't implemented the uh, that little code over there. But let's re replicate what we had in student. So let's say um, let's say we have a type uh, which is a student, and the student is a struct, and the struct has some fields, uh, you know, uh, name which is a string. Okay, and then what we did, we said, okay, let's have a function uh, which will take a student as a value type uh, and implement um, a method called string and it returns a string. And then we implemented this as uh, return. Okay, and, and here we just use name. Uh, so we implemented like this, right? So what we have is we have a, a, a student struct and we have a method which is called string. 
We didn't declare the student struct as, um, as uh, implementing the stringer interface, but if I create uh, if I create a, a student here, so if I say I have a student student and Marius, uh, and I will pass s to my magic, it will work, right? And it's a little bit nice because uh, as you see, I have a stringer interface, which is defined in, um, in the format package. I have a student struct, which is defined somewhere. Uh, and then what I can do is I can wire those two things up by implementing a method on my, on my type and then it will automatically become an instance of a stringer interface. And then I can pass it to my magic function uh, and it will be treated as a stringer, right? In Java, for example, you cannot do that because you have to say that your particular class, student class implements particular interface. You have to hardwire it. But here you have a flexibility of adding extra interface wiring uh, dynamically to your types such that they will become available to you. Uh, and that's uh, super nice. Uh, so you can define your own interfaces. So you can define your own um, type, um, I don't know, data, which is uh, interface of some sort. You can say some method here, uh, you know, method. And then this method uh, returns something. Let's, let's make this method return a string. And then as long as um, the particular object or type in your, in your code implements that, that method method, yeah, let's call it foo, uh, like foo method, then it will become an instance of data interface. And then you can use it and you can pass it and you can do kind of a polymorphic things. Um, so it's in Go, it's kind of nice, even though you don't have inheritance as such, you have this sort of a flexible mechanism of combining a behavior in such a way that you can add behavior and you can reuse behavior uh, using the um, this sort of a construct of uh, using interfaces as a placeholder, right? So I can put any struct in here or any type in here that implements uh, the stringer interface. And the stringer interface to add, add to your own data structures is as simple as adding a string method on your data structures, right? So I hope this is um, quite clear and that, that is quite fundamental. You will notice um, this pattern using interface quite a lot. Um, and also you will use the interfaces which you define yourself. Uh, Yes, so interfaces are useful. Uh, there is a question from Victor. Uh, interfaces are useful for making um, flexible functions. It is, um, it, it, it is about functions, but it's also about types. So for example, if you want to have um, a certain, uh, like it, it's the same as in C++ or in um, other programming languages where you want certain uh, function, which will do different things for different types. Uh, and then what you do is you define an interface. Let's say you want to access a database and the database will have like in it and it will have um, uh, close uh, two things, right? And then what all you do is you say, okay, please give me a database and I want to initialize it. And then I want to close it. And then how it is done can be done for the in-memory database or database using graph uh, structures or database using something else. And for you calling it, it will be kind of, you are independent of how you call it, uh, how it is implemented because you call it always the same way. So it allows you to kind of uh, structure your logic in such a way that you hide some of the implementation details uh, behind the interfaces and then uh, have a nice API for whatever you're doing in your project. Um, that's right. So the, the delegation is, um, uh, in one way used as a kind of the implementation, particular implementation for your interfaces, but you can also use delegation in a very traditional way by, um, uh, so let me go back here. So uh, to answer the delegation means implementing an interface. Yes, you can, you can say that, 
uh, but you can also uh, use delegation in um, in a, uh, let's say we have um, um, yeah so let, let's say I have my data interface and data is, is doing something is doing some foo uh, so then what I can do in the magic is I can add kind of a, a, another parameter uh, and I can say um, the D is is data and then uh, you wire up your logic in such a way that instead of you doing it like um, student doing it uh, you can say um, will delegate it to this other object which will do the logic for me. So the implementation can be split into two parts and this part of the implementation delegates the particular functionality to, to another part. Uh, yeah, it's, it's probably a little bit um, a little bit unclear uh, but the point is you don't need to implement everything about the student in the student. you can implement some things about the student in person and then delegate, you can call it on a student, but instead of doing it in the student, you will say, okay, that actually, that particular logic belongs to a person. So I will delegate the call to a person, do it there and then come back here, right? We will, I, I will show you like when I go back to the student's example. Um, can you inherit from multiple interfaces? Of course, that's the, that, that's the part here that, um, let, let's uh, come back. Yeah, I deleted this. So, it, um, uh, okay, let's revert back. So I have a student. I have um, I have a student struct, and I have the uh, stringer interface, and I have the the data interface. So now I have implemented a student to be stringer because it implements this method. But I can as easily say uh, func student uh, also is a data interface because it has a method foo, right? Um, and foo is returning string. So I will return as name as well. And now student is both a data and a stringer, right? This defines it as a stringer this defines it as data and you can have kind of multiple interfaces instantiated in a single data structure which in our case is a student does it make sense so you are free to implement as much as you want in fact golang is um, super fancy uh, so for those of you who are a little bit more advanced what i can show you is that i can have a function so i can have a type so let, let's change our data type to be, to not be an interface, but instead uh, to be a function. So a data is a function which takes a um, stringer uh, and produces a string, okay? Um, so now I defined a type which is actually a function. And then uh, I can, I can say that um, I have um, a function which takes data and where is my foo? Um, let's say I have a processor interface that has a method foo which produces something string. Right, so now I have two interfaces. Uh, one is the processor and one is the stringer. And I have a data type, which is a function. And I can define a function on, um, I can define this. And then what I can do is I can pass, uh, and then my data function will actually implement that interface and I can pass it if I have another function, like another magic function, which takes um, uh, which takes a processor, I can pass it in as well. So you can kind of do a little bit of a magic with functions uh, in in Golang. But I will maybe I will talk a little bit about it in a minute. Um, yeah. So if if you have uh, multiple names which are the same. 
then you have to prefix it with like which interface it, it, it relaunches. There, there is, um, uh, yeah, if, if you want to prevent the conflict, I actually don't remember how you're preventing conflicts, but I think what you do is you have to uh, um, use the fully qualified name of the interface and the method to kind of uh, distinguish which string you will be calling. You will be calling that string or that string. Um, I, I think it, it works like that. I actually don't remember exactly how Golang is uh, preventing kind of a name collision, uh, whether it's a compiler preventing it or whether the, you know, you have to uh, de, um, demultiplex it. Um, okay, so let's continue with the, with the quiz. Uh, next question. Next question is easy. So initiate B to a slice of ints and do it in one line. So I will kind of clear this up so I can continue playing with the code. Okay. So how are you guys doing with the... uh small b not capital b that would be good yes so that's a good answer uh that's a good answer that's almost a good answer just a typo Sm should be small b that would be nice to have syntax like this but it doesn't work that's wrong uh those are this is a size of the slice or slice of the array size so you can only have one number in here you, we're using curly braces for that kind of content. Um, right, so most of you, a lot of people did, did fine. It was not actually a quiz question. So um, this is the correct answer, right? So we're saying B is a new variable. Uh, it is of type slice of ints. And then using curly brace, curly brace notation, we are initializing it. So yeah, sorry that it wasn't a quiz question. Um, how about the next one? Question three. There is a question, can you do without the, uh, so the question was B equals slice of int, and then we initialize it, right? So we have some initialization. Uh, the question was, um, can we do it without this operator? And the answer is, Yes, but then you would do it slightly differently because you would like, first of all, if you, if you try to assign it, it will complain that B is uh, uh, undeclared, right? To, for this to work, you would have to first declare it. So you would have to say, I, I am declaring B and B is of some type. So I would have to say B is of the, of the type slice of int, right? Uh, but if you do that, uh, then uh, you don't need to prefix it. You can say B is, um, no, actually, I think you have to prefix it with the type um, anyway. Yeah, so then, uh, yeah, so it just complains that I, I'm not using it. So if I just print, print something, so, Format print print value and say B, then uh, everything will be fine. And then that occupies two lines of code. Um, normally, the idiomatic way is if you can write something in one line, you should don't use two lines because it's just uh, why would you do that? Uh, it's a bit easier to do that because all the information is here. I know that I'm declaring B. I know what B type is and I know what the initial values are. So this is a, a nicer, more idiomatic way, but the previous one, this one is equivalent. It's, it's, it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same code. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so that's the, the Menti code is here. So question three, it's a little bit more advanced. Um, 
Okay, stop the quiz. So the declare. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. This is the first one. This is the first question. Define a type data that represents a map of strings to ints. So we're mapping strings to ints, and we want to have our own type called data with capital D. How would you do that? Okay, I yes, so some people got it right. Uh, so you start with the keyword type, it's a Golang keyword, then you type your name of your type, and then you say what it is. Uh, so in Golang, the map is defined as map, another keyword, and then the type of the keys and the type of the values. Uh, so that's how you will, would define a data type that represents a map between strings and ints. Um, perfect for, for that person. Uh, not too good because not many answers and uh, it seems to be a bit hard. But knowing that already, um, how would you do, how would you define uh, a variable D to be of data type and initiate it in one line? So similar to this B example that we just had, how would you do that in one line? That, that one is uh, not tricky because we just showed you how to do that um, here. Whoa, well, yes, there, there is a correct answer. Let's see. Uh, no one got the, the right answer. So why this is a little bit tricky? Because we have another keyword called make, right? What is this make about? Well, um, in here we have a slice of ints. Uh, and to initiate it, we just say, okay, B is a slice of ints with values one and two, right? What will happen if I... Um, if I did nothing, is B like nil? Yes, B is nil, which means it's an empty slice. Um, it's the same if I, if I said um, int is an empty slice, right? Uh, it's exactly the same if I do nothing or if I do this. If I do this line, um, then this line is the same as this one uh, because a nil slice of ints is an empty, empty uh, empty slice. So in our case, we have a type, which is data, and it's a map between a string and int. Um, and what we can do is, it's basically the same thing, right? So you say we have a D, which is of data type. Um, and that means uh, I have an uh, uninitialized nil data, which is an empty, empty map. Um, but if you try to, to use it, you will see that uh, actually an empty map uh, is not really usable yet. You have to kind of um, get a reference to it. So this line is not enough. You actually have to have a second line. And the second line would be uh, that you say make data. So then uh, it's like uh, it's like a equivalent to a new keyword uh, in C, C++, which basically creates a new instance of that type, uh, which in my case creates kind of a new um, new data, right? Uh, I can do the same. I can achieve the same thing uh, by saying D equals data open close bracket, right? And that would mean I have now an empty map, uh, which is initialized. So whether I do this 
or whether I do this, it's exactly the same. And you would have to, you know, uh, read all the repositories and kind of check what is more idiomatic way of doing it. And I, I feel it's th this one is a bit more idiomatic. Uh, it's a little bit simpler uh, and you don't need this kind of extra keyword, right? So both are correct answer, uh, but usually this one is a little bit nicer. Why? Uh, imagine that I have a piece of code, like situation one, I have this code, um, and then I have to say, actually, I want to initialize D to be Marius um, 40, okay? Uh, then I need another line of code. I need to say, okay, D out of Marius, uh, Marius is 40, okay? So in the situation two, when I said this, the change will be in the same line. I can just say Marius uh, 40, right? You see, like the like here I ended up with uh, three lines of code. Here, I can do kind of everything in one line and the change is just modifying that single line. So to re get rid of the initialization of some data, I can do it kind of in line, whereas here I have to do it in separate lines. Uh, as I said, like if you can express something more concisely, it's usually better. Uh, so therefore, I would like personally, I prefer that notation. But both are correct, right? Um, yes. So new does kind of a heap allocation, and we're using new for some of the data types, uh, especially if you want to get a pointer, right? Uh, here I'm kind of allocating a, an instance on a value type, uh, and then to get a pointer out of it, I can do this, uh, sorry, um, I can do this. Um, and then D becomes like a pointer. I could say new data, and then that would kind of create uh, um, a reference to a, a value type, which is data, correct? So you can use either make or new. Uh, if you allocating, in our case, was uh, it wasn't star data, it was data. That means you would have to use make or the curly braces. Um, okay, so let's continue. Uh, we okay, that one is that one should be simple. So given that M is a map between strings and ints, print line the int for Tom. So you have M, which is a map, and you want to write a line of code which will print the integer for Tom. How would you do that? So you need to use print line. You need to use this um, function. And then you need to pass it a parameter which will extract that int out of this map. And the map is M. Yeah, good choice. So uh, the the correct syntax, of course, is you know uh, with p being kind of capital, like um, the zoom. No, a mentimeter makes things case insensitive, so it doesn't matter. But you know there is no small p. All the package functions are capitalized; otherwise, they are private, so you cannot use them, right? So it has to be capital. And then we have an m. And we use the square brackets to extract the value of the Tom key, right? So the uh, the key comes here, and then we get the value out. Um, there is a, a similar notation. So if I um, because I already have my uh, my data, so if I make uh, the Tom uh, Tom is twenty, and then. I want to, to extract the, the value out of Tom, right? So I, I will extract the value like this. And then I say my V is, is this. Um, what if there is no key? So what happens if I do this, um, Alice? Um, well, uh, you will have some sort of a problem because there is no Alice, right? So what should uh, this one return? 
Well, this one will return a nil value for something which doesn't exist. And as we know, in Golang, we don't have null pointers. So like uh, there is no uh, null for an int. Uh, so the nil value for int is what? Is zero, right? So if I ask this, I will get zero. So V will be zero. What if I make Tom zero, but Tom exists? Then if I have uh, V for uh, Alice, and if I have uh, v, v for Tom, then if I ask that same question, that one will also return zero for me. But what if I want to know if Tom is in my data or not? Because I cannot distinguish, like they both give me zero, right? So there is an additional um, uh, value which the, this construct returns, which is the, um, um, so one is uh, V and okay. And then I can say D out of Tom. And then uh, V will be the value in my case zero, but okay will be whether Tom was there or not. And then if I do it for Tom, okay will be true. And if I do it for Alice, okay will be false, right? Uh, so that's the uh, kind of a fancy way of uh, dealing with uh, nils because in languages where you have actual null, uh, then what will happen is your, your query to, um, your query to Tom, if Tom doesn't exist, will return you not an integer, will it return you a nil. And then you can say, if the return is nil, then I know Tom didn't exist. But in Golang, there is no uh, kind of null value for int. The null value for int is zero. Um, doing menti on the phone is hard. Yes, I, I agree with that statement. <laughs> Especially if there are coding questions. All right, so one more and we have a break. Uh, so, okay, that one I just gave the answer. Shit, I didn't look into the Menti slide. So you guys should now score some points. Check if map has Tom, and if it does, print line, okay. So having me explain how to do it, you just need to do it. Uh, it's challenging on the phone. <laughs> um, You can do it in one line, uh, but you need to use curly braces for the if statement um, because you cannot, uh, in Golang, you cannot, um, so we don't care about the value, right? We only care about if it's there or not. So what I'm saying is I'm assigning, I, I use the underscore to, to say I don't care about the value of this of the m tom. What I care is if uh, tom exists in m, and that will be okay. Will be true or false? If it's true, if it's true, I'm doing this right. So the if statement it's kind of like a fancy if statement. Uh, the first part before the semicolon is the initialization, and then there is the if condition. And then there is a block of code, which if will do, if condition is true. Uh, and that's an idiomatic way. You will see that very often in Golang uh, for various checks, uh, for various error handlings. Uh, no, okay is not a keyword. Okay is just a variable name. So this is a variable name. This is a variable name. Uh, this returns two things. It returns the value of the tom um, of the int. Um, yeah, let me do it here. So. Uh, D is our map, and if I say D uh, Tom equals equals forty, then uh, D Tom returns two things. Uh, this this thing returns two things. The first is the value. The second is bool. Uh, true or false, right? False. And then because it returns two things, I need two variables. So first one is for value and second one is for the existence. I can call it E. Uh, and then my V, let's print it, V and E. 
So I have V and E, right? Um, it's idiomatic to call this variable okay because it communicates what we are checking. Uh, that the uh, you know, but if I call it exists, that will communicate it as well. So right, uh, doesn't matter. That that's those are just variable names. Uh, and then if we don't care about the second one, we can ignore it. So then we just have this, right? All right. Um, this pattern is very common. You you will use it. Are very very often, uh, and that's kind of like doing this. So I'm saying, okay, is Tom there? Uh, and then saying, if Tom is there, do this. Else, if Tom is not there, uh, do something else. And if I don't care about the value, um, I, I can ignore it because then I don't need. Like if I'm not using it, you see, if I'm not using v, and if I said v. Compiler will complain saying, yeah, you're declaring V, you're not using it. So then I have to use underscore. And then I, if Tom exists in D, I do this. If Tom doesn't exist, I do this. Uh, as I said, more idiomatic is just to call it okay. And even more idiomatic is to do it in one single line. So to do this. Um, That's the most idiomatic way of doing that. So if Tom is in D, I will do this block of code, the line 27. If Tom is not in D, I will do 29. All right, let's have a break. Uh, so let's do 12 minutes. So we will meet 20 past. So 12 minutes break. So Eric is suggesting we have longer time for answering questions, especially to help people on the phones. Yes, we can do that from next session for this one. Yeah, I, I will try. I will try to fiddle with the mentee. Yeah, I can do that.
Excellent. So, uh, do you guys see my screen? Yes, great. So uh, there is a question from Victor. If you have an interface that has multiple functions, like let's say a string inter interface had two functions, two methods, um, do you need to implement both to be part to be uh, a stringer? And the answer is yes. However, because the answer is yes, it's very typical for two things in Golang. One is that all the interfaces are called R something like data air or string air or uh, I don't know, they, they kind of uh, prefix it with air if that makes sense. But um, if basically it's the, the function that the interface does plus e, ER <laughs> and that the interfaces are kind of one function uh, because you can compose them, right? Because you don't have the, uh, you don't need to have uh, interfaces that are kind of a complex, you can decompose them into multiple, like you can decompose a single interface into multiple interfaces, each interface with a single function, and then it's kind of just one function. But yes, uh, uh, normally, if you want to have a more complex interface that consists of multiple, uh, multiple functions, uh, then you would have to implement all of them. And then which one would you use to, to, to make the name, right? Uh, so uh, the, by design, they were thinking, well, you know, the interfaces should be just a single function and then you just add air to it. And that's kind of like an idiomatic convention. But of course, you may have uh, cases where you want multiple. Um, uh, yeah, they are using the kind of the same example as we did with animal. Uh, we just use a student, kind of almost the same <laughs> uh, name and age as well. Uh, so uh, you would have to implement all the methods. Um, so that's the that's the answer. Um, okay, so we were at the um, at this pattern, uh, and there is uh, a question. Uh, I don't took show those questions because I have hard time like uh, unshowing them. Um, so there is a question where the structs are the only way to implement classes. Uh, and it again depends what you, what you think a class is. If you think the class is a container of some state, then structs in Golang are the way to do that. Uh, so the container of a state of some attributes, some kind of uh, variables like uh, we had in the case of a student, like you know, it contains some fields then it's a struct. But if you think about classes as a containers of behavior, then interfaces are the way to do it. Uh, so then you can use interface to say, I have certain behaviors, uh, and then you will have certain implementation based on a particular state or not. So, so sometimes um, if you, uh, it's not that often, but you may see, uh, a certain types which are like this, like you can say, uh, my type is I don't know maybe um, let's uh, let's do that actually. So let's do this. So you you could say um, you could say I have a data type which is a struct, but it's an empty struct, right? Uh, my data is kind of an empty struct, and then my data have some functions uh, which I'm implementing, so like foo or whatever that is, uh, and then my data becomes an instance of a particular interface, but it doesn't have any state. So it's sort of like a, a class in C++ which has no attributes, only functions, right? So you can have it like this. Um, but if you do have attributes, then of course those attributes will come will come here, uh, and then yes, it's a struct plus those are uh, methods, right? So that's how you do classes, um, more or less. All right, so let me delete that. Let's say type d data was a map between string and int. All right. So any other questions? Uh, 
If not, let's proceed. We have how people are doing. Yeah, Earthman is doing very well. Uh, by thousand points beating the, the next two people, Frederick and Leon. Uh, all right, let's, uh, let's continue. This one is easy. I didn't extend the time for this one. Um, how you do an infinite loop in Golang? A very simple construct. How can you write an infinite loop? Do it in one line. All the answers and all the uh, quiz questions in Menti are sort of one-liners. So, and use spaces. I know you, you don't technically need to use spaces, but again, it's kind of a nice, I think um, Mentimeter uh, treats white spaces as, um, so I, I, I don't think it will treat them as wrong. Um, this one is matched correctly. These ones are not. So even though the capitalization, I think, doesn't matter, the spaces may matter. So those are kind of correct, but they, the F should be small. You don't need true. That's the whole point. Uh, the whole point is that you're basically saying uh, forever, like uh, do this for loop, this body, like uh, there is no condition, which means you just keep going. Okay, spaces matter. Malin says spaces matter. So sorry. Uh, right, so next one. Uh, some people love loops, uh, but Golang has, uh, as you've been doing the, the tour, Golang has uh, basically a single keyword for loop, which is four, which is great, right? Uh, because like in uh, C++, you have to learn more and in some languages, uh, a lot of different keywords for the kind of simple things. So four, uh, and then if you say uh, four I equals uh, whatever, whatever the, uh, we want some counter and then E++ that we have like a typical C++ C for loop. Uh, the difference is we don't use those curly braces around the, those you technically can use them, but they are, I think they are not illegal, but they are bad style. Uh, let's see. So um, maybe they are illegal. I don't know. Anyway, don't use them. Uh, then the while loop is kind of the same, but instead of using a, a while keyword, you use this and then you say condition. Uh, so for example, I don't know, h until h is uh, bigger than, no, no. Uh, for h being bigger than uh, zero, do this loop. And then when h is smaller than zero or equal than zero, st stop doing that, right? Uh, so that's like a while loop, but with the, for keyword and then if this condition is true you can skip it and that's you end up with the forever loop um, so that's fine uh, but what if we want to iterate uh, over 10 numbers and want we want to print this so we want to print um, uh, print line and we want to print i okay so i'm printing from 0 to 10 for, uh, from 0 to 9 um, okay what do you want from me um, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I will not be debugging that. Uh, what I want to, to show you is that um, the for loop introduces kind of an index and introduces uh, uh, some sort of logic of what the loop will be doing. And then you kind of in the body, you, you sort of using those variables, right? So let's, let's have like a slice so let's let's have some data, and my data is a slice of ints, and it's uh, the the previous uh, example, right? So I have a data, and then I don't want to print i; I want to print the data of i, right? 
Uh, then you see I'm kind of carrying over the, the state from, um, from this line into this line. And then it, it is fine, it works, but it's kind of a lot of boilerplate to read uh, what is actually happening. Uh, and also like this condition is wrong now because the condition should be length of data, right? So I have po possible sources of bugs uh, because of the boilerplate. So typically we don't do that. We don't do this, uh, if we can avoid doing loops, we, instead of doing this type of loop, we do a range loop. And the range loop is, you have again, two variables. So you have a variable, which is the index and you have a variable, which is a value. And then you have a range and then you have some sort of collection. In, in our case, it's data, right? And this line is much cleaner and much easier to read. It basically says, you know, um, get me all the indexes from zero to length of data in i and give me all the values in um, out of the out of the data right and because i'm only printing values then i don't need even that i just print values and because i don't care about indexes then i can substitute it with the um, underscore so this is like the idiomatic way of doing iterating over that slice or array or whatever you have to iterate over or map right so typically you end up with some arrays or lists or maps and you need to iterate, then usually you should use range unless it's impossible. If it's impossible, of course, you have to use the normal classic for loop, uh, but uh, this is preferred way of, of iterating. Um, all right, so yeah, we compared it with the range and clearly the range wins, right? Uh, the range is much more readable, it's more concise, it's less error prone. I don't need to kind of keep looking at the ed edge condition, like it will do all of that for me. So it's much better. Um, you do have that in some other languages as well, uh, but uh, let's talk about what Golang doesn't have. So make S a slice of ints from one to thousand. <laughs> so basically we want to do this but not from one to four, we want to do this uh, from one to thousand. So from one to thousand. I'm not gonna be typing that, right? I'm not gonna be typing five. So how can we do this? Yeah, that's a good try. Um, if you turn, if you turn the index around, and if instead of array you say what type that array is of, uh, you will have something, right? So I love this one. I love this one. <laughs> I love this one. Uh, Yes, that's the uh, um, ways of you how how you could express it. So this one doesn't work. Like this one, um, let's say, I would love to have syntax like this. That would be the the easiest, right? So it tells me like how I should jump and what's the end condition. Some languages have that. Like Rust has that. So if I say jump every three, I would do this, jump every one, I would do this and that would, would work. That doesn't work in Golang, unfortunately. So that doesn't work. Uh, if I do thousand, uh, so let's say, then uh, Yeah, so I think it complains about that line, but I don't think that line is a problem. Uh, right. Let's see. Um, up string of int. Oh, come on. Int. 
All right, uh, function data doesn't do anything. Yeah, so uh, we didn't define the data. Okay, and now that uh, say, yes, uh, you cannot range over 1,000. So sorry, uh, that was kind of a good try. One of you said that. Uh, no, so none of that works. <laughs> So the answer is, yeah, Go sucks. Uh, Go doesn't have any syntax to do that. It would be so nice to have that, but it doesn't work. And that doesn't work either. So how can we do this? How can we have S um, from, uh, from 1 to 1,000, right? Um, well, you have to ask yourself, uh, why do you need S from 1 to 1,000? Maybe you don't need S from 1 to 1,000. Maybe you just want to print from one to thousand, right? So if you want to print from one to thousand, what you can do is you can say, okay, I have um, an array of integer, which is thousand uh, integer long, uh, and I don't care what they have because this array will just have just zeros. So I don't have about the values, but I care about the index and I want to print uh, index, index plus one, right? So if you do this, you don't, you can skip the second one. So then um, I, why you complain, print line, yes. So let's do print of a value separated by a new line character uh, and we printing the, that thing. Uh, what do you don't like? Composition literal. And ideas, remove parentheses. I, yes, this one. And I don't need these ones and it still complains. Um, print. All right, let me do sanity check. Uh, so that is correct. We are having, no, that was correct. What you don't like? Yes, you can use the infinite loop. You can use something else, but um, uh, sometimes inlining this sort of array. Um, ah, yeah, I have to say, yeah, I know what's wrong. So this is a type, but I haven't instantiated the kind of the array yet. It's just a declaration of what it is, but not that it is that array, right? So to actually have it, I have to initialize it and I have to either um, make it or I have to use the curly braces, right? Uh, so now that will work. And now uh, this one says, um, yeah, that's, let's save it. Let's remove the infinite loop. Let's save it. And now, yeah, let's, um, anyway, th this is correct, right? So now the compiler or the linter don't complain and it kind of works. So if you want kind of to iterate over something or count to something, this is kind of also an, an idiom, but you can use the normal traditional uh, loop as well. Uh, there is no way for you to initialize it. So if you want this S, you would have to say, well, I have S, which is a slice of uh, ints and it will be a nil slice. And then here, what you will do is you will start with zero. Ah, uh, no, uh, we want from one to thousand. So you would say s equals append uh, s, and then you would start from one, right? So I will kind of uh, uh, iterate. Yeah. So let's do this. Yeah. So then I will um, iterate over um, uh, s this range and then do from one to thousand and kind of make this slice to be from one to thousand, right? Um, yes, syntax wrong. Uh, it's, um, and 
Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so that works fine. Okay. Uh, so another thing that the Golang uh, doesn't have. So what what would you do if you want to have S to be a slice of wins that are consecutive powers of two up to two to power of ten, right? So we want uh, two, four, uh, eight, sixteen, and so on up to thousand twenty four up to two to the power of 10. How would you do that? Why I have this question popping up? Okay, we have this, we have this. Yeah, anyway, the, the point of that question is that that would be a nice syntax. That's kind of a Python-ish, and it's called um, list comprehension. So you define what your list or what your slice or whatever that, that collection is, what values it should have, and what kind of a generator it's using, and what kind of uh, expression it should be evaluating. Again, that doesn't exist in Golang. Um, it exists in Rust. <laughs> Uh, or uh, Haskell or some other nice programming languages, even in Python. But in Golang, we don't have it. So in, in Golang, again, we have to tell the compiler exactly what we want. So we have to say, well, we have to go from one to thousand and we have to say, I want the consecutive powers of two. Uh, and then you say power of, um, uh, you would have to keep track of what is the, the, the kind of the power. So, uh, power of two to i, right? Um, so you would have to kind of write it uh, in here by appending the, the list, right? You can kind of do it in one line. You can do this appendix um, kind of in, in one line, but it's, it still requires you to do a computation like a verbose. You have to have this counter and you have to kind of com compute what you want. You cannot kind of do ranges or you cannot do things like this, right? All right, so um, let's close this up, this one up. Uh, we have one final uh, quiz. So the final quiz is define a function that adds two numbers. <laughs> yeah, super trivial. Uh, one liner, 45 seconds. So let me clear that up. Why I want you to write a function which adds two numbers. Yeah, that's way too long. Okay, maybe on the phone this it makes sense. Great. I can see a lot of good answers. I think Menti will bug you about spaces and shit like that. Uh, this is correct. Uh, so we basically have pass two integers. It has to return int and then you return the sum. Okay. So now um, that's, that's perfectly fine. Uh, what if we uh, want to take a function uh, which takes a function, which takes two numbers and returns an int. Uh, so if I have my meta function, so my, met, my function foo, and that function takes f, and f is a function, which I can do this. So um, I can call f with one and two, and it will uh, return three uh, because, um, no, it will return something, it will return an int, uh, and I want to call it with a function which adds two numbers, right? So here, what I do is I say, okay, f is actually a function which takes two numbers, a and b, uh, and they are of type int, and the return of the f is int, right? So I do this, and then when I want to call it, uh, I want to call foo, 
I would say, okay, take my adder. Adder takes A and B, which are ints. It returns an int and it basically returns uh, A plus B. Um, return. Yeah, and then I can uh, do something with it. I can print the result, right? So I can have an adder or whatever function you want declared as a lambda function here and pass it to foo, which accepts a function, right? Uh, why I'm showing you that? Because um, that is quite a typical pattern as well, especially for writing web handlers, where you kind of passing your web handler to another function, which kind of decorates it and then, uh, or changes it to fit a particular API, and then you can call it, right? So I'm kind of uh, passing it to foo, and then I'm calling it, uh, but um, I can, um, sort of pass um, different things. And I can kind of, uh, for example, I can have a function. So foo accepts only a function which takes two integers, right? Foo doesn't accept a function which takes uh, three parameters, uh, like a logger, okay? So I can have another function which has a logger. Um, so I have uh, my foo. Uh, my foo uh, has, um, two parameters, which are the, uh, for, for adding, but it also takes a logger, which is like a log, uh, logger uh, parameter. And I want to log what I'm doing. So I want to add two numbers, uh, add two numbers and log it, right? Uh, but I cannot pass my foo to foo because my foo takes three parameters and foo takes functions only with two parameters, right? So I have to uh, have a function which changes my foo to, which converts it to the interface of, of what foo expects. So I will have a generator or some form of factory function. So I let's call it factory, which accepts a function f that is a function of uh, three things. So like a, a, B, which are ints and uh, log, which is a log logger. Uh, and what it, and this one will return. Um, so the factory takes that function and returns a function which is compliant with foo, right? So this function is a function which takes uh, A and B only and returns an int. And what factory does, is it takes f, um, calls it, uh, no, it, it takes, um, it returns, return uh, a new function, which takes a, b, and returns an int. And this new function is basically calling f um, with, um a and b and log right and then what i can do here i can say foo and now i can say factory um my foo my foo and i can pass sorry i can pass one and two and um log logger I, logger um, yeah let's let's have a new logger so i have a log which is log logger um, right so i kind of um i i have certain interface and that interface expects certain function and I have my function, which is kind of a more fancy, uh, but then I need to fit into that interface. So I'm kind of having a factory which converts it for me. Uh, and then it's sort of, um, um, yeah, there are some small uh, hiccups. I am missing something. I'm missing a bracket. Um, I don't want to spend time on this uh, or fixing like the syntax again. Uh, the idea is that uh, you can use functions as first instance objects, 
uh, you can pass them to other functions and you can kind of convert them to fit into what is expected. And that is kind of useful and you will use it for some of the web handlers, right? <clears throat> So can lambdas capture variables where they are defined? Yes, they can. So depending on when you define your lambda, lambda can have uh, access to um, the state which is in the scope. So for example, if I have uh, if I have some int here, let's say I have some um, I don't know a, uh, which is ten. The uh, not a. Let's call it um, a a a. Then in here. Uh, this lambda, which I am defining, uh, can use AAA because it see uh, it, it 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 is in the same scope, so it will see it, and that's kind of again a, a nice pattern for capturing state. So you can, for example, have certain counters uh, where you kind of uh, like I what I can do is I can uh, show you another uh, pattern which is often used. So for example, you can say. Uh, counter is uh, a function which uh, returns a function that um, takes no arguments and returns an int. Uh, and that function is like uh, my counter is zero and then uh, return a function which takes no parameters and returns an int. And that function is saying my counter plus one and return my counter, right? Um, and I basically have kind of like a, uh, instead of declaring a global variable, I have kind of a, a function now where I can say, uh, uh, I can say here, uh, my counter equals um, counter. And then every time I call my counter, it will return me a new value and the new value will be incremented by one, right? So I can now keep calling this and it will continue uh, increasing my kind of a state. So of course you can do that. You can capture the, um, the state in lambdas. Okay, um, so let's quickly check the leaderboard. Um, Well, Earthworm rocks the crowd. Earthman, I mean, sorry. Um, all right, so structs and methods we covered. Uh, functions I just did now, uh, covered like the how you do fancy second order functions. So Go is derived from C, but it has much more functional feel because doing all of that in C or C++ would be a bit of nightmare in terms of syntax. Yes, you can do it. You can achieve those things in uh, other languages, but the syntax is a little bit more clunky and it's a little bit harder to use. So um, it, it does, Golang uses a lot of functional kind of patterns. Um, so we've, we've played with that. We defined those inner functions. So I don't want to spend time on this slide because I already went through it. Uh, I just want to highlight uh, one final point that um, slices are not lists. So slices, like if I say I have an int, uh, sorry, uh, slice of ints, and that's my S, right? Uh, it's not really a list. Uh, it's, it's really just like a slice. It's like a kind of like a dynamic array. Uh, if you want to, to do something on lists, if you want to do some list processing, if you want to be like uh, processing from the head down to a tail or doing some things with lists, then you have to use like the standard library list construct. And there is like a, a container list package and it defines um, the type which is list and you can use list like a proper list. Uh, so for example, um, I gave you a homework and in the homework you have some, like it's in, it also in the, um, it's defined in the um, in the tasks, like just doing a simple kind of a comprehensions of lists. Uh, then maybe a list is a better uh, data structure for it instead of a slice or an array, right? Um, so I will post the slides on the lecture notes such that you will have some references for some of the constructs and you will have some, uh, some references about the, um, 
um, the tasks. So lists and slices are both dynamic arrays, yes, but lists is kind of a more of a, it has a more of a list flavor, uh, where a slice has more of an array flavor, right? Um, I want to do one final thing. So I uh, ran out of time. I was a little bit too ambitious and I was too slow uh, and I didn't uh, do uh, what I was intending. And they were two things. Uh, one was concurrency uh, and one was uh, error handling. Uh, I will do um, concurrency uh, on the additional video. Uh, I will record a little bit about like how you deal with um, concurrency constructs in an additional video, which I will attach to this uh, lecture. Uh, what I will finish with is like, I will show you how you do error handling. So in our implementation of a student, for example, uh, where we have um, what we were creating, we were creating a person, yes. So when we were creating a person, we have used like a panic uh, and the panic basically Golang has two ways of handling errors. Golang doesn't have uh, exceptions. Uh, so you have to handle errors manually. Uh, everything that you are doing in the code, you have to check. You don't have sort of like an exception which we can you can propagate. If you want to propagate, you have to propagate an error. Uh, and then panic is one of the mechanisms of like Com completely uh, throwing out your hands and saying, I don't know how to recover from it. Uh, I will crash the, the, the program. Uh, and it's a bad practice to use panic. Um, panic is a bad, um, bad um, construct to use where you can use an error instead. Of course, panic has its place. Sometimes you have an unrecoverable error and then you want to panic. Uh, and then there is a panic and recover. Uh, recover is sort of like a catch for a, for a panic such that you can handle your unrecoverable errors somewhere else in the code. Uh, so you can propagate it. When an er error is recoverable, and if the error is an error from the user, for example, you should always recover from errors like that. So if the user passed us a wrong, uh, uh, here is another panic. Uh, if the user passed us the wrong number of uh, parameters for creating a student, it's not our fault, it's the user fault. So we have to recover from it. The program should not crash, right? Uh, so what we do is we can substitute an, our add person function to return an error and uh, basically let the system recover from the error situation instead of panicking. So instead of panicking, we should not panic here because it's not our fault. It's not our bug. Uh, it's a problem with the input uh, and we should propagate the error up the chain. Uh, and that you do by uh, returning an error uh, error type. Uh, and then if you go to Golang, uh, again, if you search for Golang uh, error uh, interface, you will see why it's so big. Um, again, I want to go to the... Doc. Well, I would need to navigate it. I, I will just, it will be faster for me just to uh, kind of type it here. So uh, type <laughs> error is an interface that uh, is defined as a function which has a single, like uh, an interface that has a single function that returns a string. This is the definition of an error. Uh, and then when you're returning an error, uh, you are basically returning something that you can call capital error on and, and re it will return a string. And the easiest way for, for doing that is to say error um, dot um, um, there is an errors this one. 
And this one is basically uh, a default implementation of that interface, which contains a single field, which is a text. And instead of panicking, you can always propagate the text up the chain, and then you can kind of display it to the user or do something with it. And it's kind of like a typical pattern that you use. So you say errors dot new, and you push push a, a, a string into it, and then it will become kind of a, an error. So that's one. Uh, and then the other one is, you see here, the error is not with the user data. The error is that the user data has a wrong format. And the wrong format comes from the string conf, and it gives me another error. Uh, so now what I could do is I could basically do the same thing. So I could say, um, yeah, so here I'm saying return nil with the error. Uh, and here I would say uh, return uh, a nil. And I can also say errors uh, new uh, and then say uh, wrong format. But I kind of should not be doing that because it's not like, um, it's this package which gives me the error. So what I should say is there is something wrong with my creation of the, of the person, but the error is really that one. So I'm roping one error inside another error. Uh, and for that, there is a, another construct. So instead of doing this new thing, uh, what you should do is you should do this. You should say um, error, um, come on. Help, help me here, errors. Um, yeah, it's actually, it's in format package. So it's format, it's called error F. And then what you do is you say uh, problem, problem creating person. Uh, and then you have this uh, uh, particular uh, roper thingy, which is called uh, percent %w, and then you include your original error into that, into that error, right? So this, this function returns an error. You see it returns an error. So I can return an error from my function. And this function kind of uh, robs my high level error, uh, my error into a, another error, which is given to me from this line. Uh, and here I will say return nil, right? So this is kind of an improved error handling construct where you, for simple, um, for simple errors, you handle like you define what they are yourself. For in uh, kind of a hierarchical errors, you define what your your error is, and and you wrap the other error inside. And then in the method which calls this method, when you get the error, you can kind of print it or you can handle it. You can do whatever you want to to tell the user what went wrong, and you can unwrap. There is like a uh, in in uh, error package, there is an unwrap function which takes an error and gives you that inner error. Um, and I will kind of modify the code. I will push the code into the repo, and then you will see kind of a idiomatic way of handling errors in in GoLang using the the demo code that we have for the student. Okay, so uh, for error handling, you will see the the details in the uh, in the code. And for the three constructs about concurrency, I will have additional video that I will um, uh, post in the, in the lecture uh, on, um, on GitLab in the wiki, OK? So sorry for going over time. Uh, uh, it's a, you know sometimes a little bit tricky to time it properly. Uh, but the basic error handling will be demonstrated in the code. Uh, and you will see how you can unwrap the error and how you can uh, how you wrapping an errors is already here uh, and how you're doing simple errors. Uh, and then for the concurrency, there are kind of a three constructs that I will define and uh, there will be additional code and additional uh, small lecture that I will uh, attach to the to the wiki. So that's it for today. Thank you very much. And uh, for the BPROC students, uh, next Monday we will have no class, uh, you will start with Haskell and you will watch the video that I posted uh, on the wiki. Uh, and for the cloud course, you will continue with uh, Christopher uh, explaining more about uh, the HDP 
and JSON, and you will continue Golang, uh, some Golang constructs, which will be helpful for you for uh, doing the assignments and doing the project. So that's, that's all from me for today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tomas. Um, all right, there are two questions. So those of you who hasn't quit yet, uh, why does it seem that Golang have so many unnecessary conditions for syntax? Um, I don't know that uh, you would have to ask the Golang designers. Um, and then is there a good correct way of doing do while? Uh, so turning around the, the condition. Uh, that's a good question. Like the normal for uh, kind of use is like while, uh, and then doing do while, uh, you would have to somehow um, break the, the while loop. So you'd have to have some sort of a condition at the end of your section to break out of the loop. Uh, so maybe doing a forever loop and having the condition at the end to break out of it is the way to simulate uh, do while. Uh, Do uh, proc people have a lab next Wednesday? Yes, you will. So uh, the bproc people for Prog 006, we will have no class on Monday. You watch the video about Haskell. And then Wednesday, Monday, and Wednesday, you will have uh, lectures and some practical sessions about profiling and about performance. Uh, so the examples will be most likely in C and uh, C, uh, maybe C sharp. And uh, Per Morton will tell you about data oriented design and he will tell you more about profiling and performance. Um, uh, so some resources on the function factory, I can do that. I will post you some of the um, uh, uh, documentation and some of the code uh, about like doing the function factory. In, in fact, we, we have it in the example code for some of the HTTP handlers later on in the course. So you will see how you can sort of do that because most of the time the HTTP handler requires you to deal with um, request and response. And it doesn't, for example, deal with the database connection. But to handle the request, you have to connect to your database and you have to do something. So your function usually have a database as an extra parameter. So you will see those, um, those patterns later in the course uh, when, when you will be dealing with uh, web handlers. Yeah. Any other quick questions? If not, then I will stop. Um, I will stop the share and I will stop the video. Uh, and um, I will see you guys uh, after the performance uh, classes for BPROC people. And for the cloud people, I may have some uh, appearance later for some topics that will be causing some trouble. So for now, bye.